Hi everyone, Peter Mullen here from Mullen, Mullen Natural Health Centre in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. The world is or has gone crazy at the moment and what a perfect time I thought to share with you um, a presentation that I've, that's been very popular here in Newcastle um, and that's natural remedies for how to deal or how to help with anxiety. Now, I've, I've been a naturopath now for 31 years this year and um, over that time, health has really changed a lot. And one of the things that I'm seeing a lot more of my new patients talking about when they come to see me about is about having trouble coping with stress, but also particularly experiencing anxiety as well. So it's probably not a better time in the world um, or better time in our history to actually be starting to talk about what we can all be doing to have more resilient nervous systems. So here we go. It'll take you about 45 minutes to get through this presentation with me, but um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you really get some good tips that you can start to implement straight away. So as I said, I'm a naturopath. Um, we have a practice here in Newcastle. I have actually five other naturopaths as well as, as, well as myself. Um, and we deal with all health issues. Um, autoimmune, gut issues, uh, sleep issues, hormonal balance, fertility, um, so many different areas that um, naturopaths can help you. Um, and each of us have our own special area of interest. And for me, anxiety and mood is a really big um, part of my passion, helping people with those issues rather. Now, as a practice, we're very big on community, very big on you know sharing our knowledge, sharing our information, hopefully empowering our patients to actually take more responsibility, have a greater understanding of their own health and what they can be doing to help themselves as well. So if you're not already part of our community, please like or join us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we also have a great website as well. And just in case you haven't heard of our practice before, one thing we have that's quite unique and only a new add on to what we already do, we do the traditional consultation, which you know, of course now is all online at the moment. However, we also have what we call our herb bar. And a herb bar is a setup where if you have an acute situation, if you just want some immune support, if you just want some help with the kids with ear infections or urinary tract infections or any sort of acute health issue, you can call and speak to one of our qualified naturopaths at the herb bar, no charge to you, and they can use or prescribe some of our um, practitioner strength natural medicine so it's a great way it's a great add-on if you've not got the time or yeah you this is new to you this whole natural medicine sort of area then um you know please ring up have a talk to one of our qualified naturopaths and you can get some help straight away and at the moment we're mailing um, our natural medicines out or we do have a pickup um, station in our office as well our, outside of our office so yeah but Keep an eye on the, the um, herb bar references and check it out. Now, my key, my key take home message um, with this presentation is two things. Number one is that anxiety for me is a symptom or sign of imbalance in the person's whole body. So for a long time, we've been told that anxiety and depression are all to do with an imbalance of brain chemicals. And yes, there is definitely an imbalance of our brain chemicals. However, our whole health has an impact upon what's going on with our brain chemistry. So as naturopaths, we tend to take a more holistic view and that we can be out of balance, not only physically, but also emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually as well. And that it is definitely possible to recover from anxiety, um, improving both our resilience and our well-being. So anxiety is not something, I guess that's my main message, anxiety is not something that you just have to put up with. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can help improve, recover, and actually build our um, stress coping or build our resilience. So this afternoon or today, I'm going to be talking with you a couple of areas. Are we in an epidemic about what anxiety actually is? What I see is the causes of anxiety my top five drivers of anxiety, and then natural remedies for um, anxiety. Um, so are we in an epidemic? Anxiety is the most common mental health condition in Australia. Um, on average, one in four people, one in three women, and one in five men will experience anxiety. Now, when I first started practice, you know, 31 years ago, I remember a couple of years in, um, I had a patient come to see 
to see me and um, we were talking about stress and she said she'd been to her doctor. This is how much stress is and our concept around anxiety and depression has changed in these 30 years. So she'd been to a doctor telling him that she was going through a really stressful period with a whole heap of things going on. And back then his answer to her stress coping was he said, have you ever thought of taking up um, uh, cigarette smoking? So, you know, we've come a long, long way from understanding that, you know, stress is so much more than, um, yeah, stress and anxiety is so much more than, you know, what it was thought to be. Um, and as I was saying earlier, like a lot of my patients, when they walk through the door, new patients particularly, are all um, listing anxiety as one of their, their health concerns. So in a 12-month period, over 2 million Australians will experience anxiety. Um, and, you know, who's predisposed towards anxiety? Research suggests that people with certain personality traits are more likely to have anxiety. Um, so I'm a little bit in this personality trait as well, perfectionist, a bit anal about things, control freaks. Um, I personally don't like change, which is unfortunate for me at the moment because there's a lot of change going on. Um, and family history as well. So if mum was anxious or dad was anxious, there's a greater potential then that you're going to have that potential to be more anxious as well. So understanding that's not a negative thing, but it's sort of the more we can learn about ourselves and how we function, particularly when we're stressed, the better we're going to be able to manage or learn to manage our nervous system. You know, in some respects, when we're anxiety prone, we need to learn to be in charge of our nervous system, not our nervous system run us, which unfortunately anxiety is a great example of that. So it's been estimated that up to 40% of the population will experience a panic attack at some time in their life. So, you know, you're not alone. We're not alone. Um, 25 years ago, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, one of my, another one of my patients went to a doctor and the doctor said there's no such, and telling the doctor she was stressed. And the doctor said there's no such thing as stress. It's just a bit of a new age concept. So now we'll look at where we're at today. Um, and it's an epidemic we're seeing in all ages. When I was a kid, um, kids that maybe experienced a bit of anxiety were described as being shy. You know, now we describe, we use the words anxiety. And, um, you know, why, why the increase? Why are we seeing that this rapid, massive increase in um, anxiety? Well, we're going to get to that. So what is anxiety? Because what's interesting is we probably use words like anxiety and depression more now than what we used to use, maybe words like nervous or flat. So nervous is where you've got something coming up, like it might be a sporting event, might be a test, might be a presentation. And you do feel nervous. You feel a bit sick in the tummy. You've got butterflies. You might even feel a bit twitchy. That's nervousness and that's normal. And, you know, I guess that's sort of morphed into, you know, being described as anxiety. So that type of anxiety or nervousness slash anxiety, perfectly normal. And it actually helps us to improve. You know, if I'm doing a presentation, if I don't feel a little bit nervous before the presentation, then it's going to be a flat presentation. Anxiety, though, is um, so. This type of stress or anxiety can help you make feel more help you can help you feel more alert and focused, get things done faster, um, perform better. I see a lot of HSC kids every year, and um, a lot of those kids sort of come in, you know, talking about stress and anxiety. And I always say to them, look, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's hard to be a high high achiever without a certain amount of stress or anxiety to get you there. So. Again, it comes back to us trying to, to understand what's normal for us and understand ways to like manage ourselves better. Um, anxiety, though, is when these anxious feelings don't go away. So, say if I, you know, I've done my presentation and you know I'm relaxing at home and I'm still feeling, you know, over revved or I'm still feeling anxious or I'm having panic attacks for no reasons. This is what anxiety is. So it's where the nervous system's been turned on, it's broken through the normal mechanisms that should turn it back off, and now we're in the world of um, that nervous system is constantly turned on, and that's what anxiety really is. Lots of different types of anxiety. Um, many people with anxiety experience symptoms of more than one type and may also experience depression as well. And there's a crossover in the middle between depression and anxiety, and 
what's um interesting is um <clears throat> do a lot of my patients that have low mood or problems with their serotonin what i'm finding is that often they've been under high periods of stress that sort of morphed into anxiety over a long-term period and i'm finding that this constant turned onedness of the nervous system or the the stress response is what may then lead to brain chemical shifting so for a lot of my patients that experience depression it was actually triggered or aggravated by a long term of stress and anxiety so it's kind of interesting how it all relates together um, there's a few different types of anxiety there's general anxiety disorder or GAD which is what I'll be talking about mostly today and it's been estimated nearly 6% of the population will experience GAD in their lifetime social anxiety and this is something I used to get a lot when I was um, in my early 20s you know when you go into a party and you sort of feel anxious when you first get there and it just takes you a while to settle down or you know sometimes you know we end up self-medicating I think I used to have a couple of beers before I went out I worked out after a while I had a couple of drinks I was a lot calmer because alcohol is a central nervous system depressant obviously not our ideal um, uh, port of choice but um, just interesting that you know most of us with these types of issues find ways of self-medicating around it uh, specific phobias panic disorder so again that's general anxiety disorder on steroids where it's actually the person's having panic attacks all the time as well um, OCD and it's been ex um, estimated that close to 3% of people in Australia experience OCD in their lifetime um, and post-traumatic stress disorder we're seeing a lot more people being um, diagnosed as having PTSD and PTSD you know initially we used to think of it was something that happened after you know someone had come home from war um, but PTSD can be um, you know caused by a whole host of life events as well so and again I often think that you know there's an underlying familial predisposition to be more prone towards developing these sorts of issues as well so you know family history does give us clues um, now people with GAD or general anxiety disorder generally go through the day filled with exaggerated a day filled with exaggerated worry and tension even though though there is often little or nothing to provoke it um, even the thought of getting through the day provokes anxiety um, and they can't seem to get rid of their concerns even though they realize their anxiety is more intense than warranted so what's the worst thing you can say to someone that suffers from anxiety don't stress take a chill pill you know calm your farm unfortunately and we'll look at what's actually going on in a moment these sort of sayings or comments definitely won't help because their nervous system is turned on too high it's got nothing to do with what their 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 heightened stress response or their nervous system being turned on too high is actually causing their brains to you know stay in this negative state so yeah telling someone to take a chill pill honestly doesn't help um, anticipate disaster overly concerned about health issues money family problems or difficulty to school or whack so we actually all experience these thoughts of these sorts of thoughts and feelings but for someone with anxiety as I said it's these thoughts and feelings but on steroids um, GAD can develop gradually and can begin at any age uh, the years of highest risk seem to be between childhood and middle age with the average age of around 30 and it does affect women two times more than men so one theory or thoughts my thoughts behind this are in a in a, um, a lady's reproductive or, or menstrual cycle different hormones peak and drop at different times over the month and there's been some thoughts that excess estrogen compared to a deficient or a depletion mm -hmm. of progesterone may exacerbate um, the symptoms of anxiety if someone is predisposed particularly prior to their menstrual cycle so hormones definitely um, part of me are a big part of what's actually going on imbalance in hormones not just um, women's fertility hormones but also our stress hormones as well um, so how do you know if you've got GAD and for some people listening or watching this today you might sort of tick the box with a few of these symptoms and think you know what I never actually thought I had a stress or an anxiety problem but you know maybe it is something for me to sort of check in or check out having trouble falling asleep 
startle easily. So if a car door slams, you're always jumping or twitchy. Have trouble staying asleep. Can't relax if you're going to be concentrating. When anxiety level is mild, people with GAD often function quite well. However, if severe, can have difficulty with even the simplest um, daily activities. So um, children. So we're seeing a lot more kids these, day, these days being diagnosed with GAD. And with kids, issues can often relate to performance at school, sporting events, punctuality. So kids that are constantly stressed about, you know, mum, we've got to get ready, we've got to go, we've got to leave, we're going to be late for school. Um, kids that get really perplexed or overthinking about wars or the coronavirus, what's going on at the moment, you know. If your child's constantly obsessing or talking about the virus and how's nanny and pop's health going to be and what if we get sick, that can be a sign of actual general anxiety disorder. Um, and behaviours can include all sorts of things, being over-conforming. You know, my kids particularly, uh, my daughter was definitely not a rule breaker. Um, so kids that just can't, can't even think about the concept of breaking rules or being late or being seen as being wrong, um, that can be a sign of elevated stress hormones or anxiety in your child, being a perfectionist, being unsure of oneself needing to redo tasks, um, seeking approval and insurance from um, parents, uh, teachers, siblings or friends. Um, so yeah, so all sorts of clues and tips there of what um, where you might be seeing this in your kids. So if you think your child's got an issue, um, definitely talk to someone about it because there's a lot we can do to help. So what causes, what causes anxiety? So it's definitely, definitely not simply a chemical imbalance or disorder. Some people are definitely more predisposed. Um, if you come from a family of people that are fast nervous system types, always busy, always on the go. Uh, if you come from a family history where, you know, there is a lot of anxiety or depression or issues, then you may well be more predisposed. So as I said before, it's not a negative, but understanding that helps you understand, well, okay, you know, I can have a friend going through the same stuff, living the same lifestyle as me, but they're possibly never going to experience anxiety. Whereas me, you know, I'm going to be more predisposed because of that family history. Um, and for me, anxiety really is a sign of your a person's or your whole health being out of balance. And basically, I think of anxiety as an overactive nervous system or overactive stress response. And it's basically an exaggeration of what we call or what's called our fight or flight response. So from my perspective, you know, an, an anxiety is a, um, a normal response of the brain and the nervous system that's gone haywire. So this fight or flight response comes from a primitive part of our brain, of our brain. And it comes from the reptilian part of our brain, actually. So it's a... It's, um, it's something that's in built in all animal species. You know, um, baby chickens have, an, uh, have a fight or flight response. Baby crocodiles, like all animals have this, all animals have this fight or flight response. And it's part of our um, why, you know, we're all, we're all still here after all these millions of years on the planet. So in threatening situations, the body responds with a fight or flight response. So say you're going for a walk in the jungle, come across a tiger and you get that surge of adrenaline to either wrestle the tiger or climb the nearest tree. All good. Now that stress response should turn on roughly 15 or 17, 15 to 17 minutes and should then turn back off again through a, a process of negative feedback. So the stress response should turn on. We should deal with whatever we have to deal with and it should turn back off. Um, so in the jungle, you've wrestled the tiger, you know, climb the nearest tree and then dangers out of your way you've gone for a walk again now interestingly there's a there's a book or a, an article i read called um i think it was called zebras why zebras don't get ulcers and other animals in nature <clears throat> like a zebra for instance the theory is that if the zebra so say the zebra and, and the zebra family they're going along through the savannah and they're eating the grass and having a nice time and they sort of walk around the corner and there's a lion there and the lion's trying to eat them and they're running off and, you know, and then the lion gets bored and goes off. That's my nice story. The lion, he gets a bit bored and goes away and, the, and all the zebras are still happy and healthy and, you know, they get around the corner. 
There's no benefit to the zebra remembering that they were just attacked by a lion. This is the theory. Because if they were to live in that constant state of, oh my goodness, every time I go around a corner, there could be another lion, then they would pretty much soon die out because that stress response would be heightened all the time. Like us humans, if we were on the savannah and we saw a lion or a tiger, so the idea is that zebras don't remember. They don't remember that they were just so highly stressed. They don't remember that, oh my goodness, at any time my life or my family's life could be taken by a tiger. Now us humans, on the other hand, we would remember. So the next time we went around that same corner, we would think, oh my goodness, last time I was here, there was a lion, we nearly got eaten. We couldn't survive. We couldn't survive in that environment because we would remember every time there was, there was this, that fight or flight response was triggered. Now, the thoughts are that, you know, this is a, a, a actually an involvement of our brain that say, same scenario, we're in, living in the jungle and there's a lion who lives in this certain area. The reason why we remember that the lion lived in that area is that we want to then warn the rest of our family and tribe to stay away from that area. So that stress response is actually part of how we learn and how we evolve as humans to sort of be safe. So you can see the difference. The zebra forgets that that danger is imminent because if we was to live in that constant state of stress, they probably would get ulcers. But us humans, we've evolved that we remember what happened and then we do things to sort of prevent that from happening again. So, as I said, it's a normal response to the brain. It should turn on and then it should turn off. Now, at 20, you know, most of us are 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Eat anything, drink anything, you know, nothing's, nothing's an issue. As we get older, the nervous system is the same as any other system in our body. It just it gets more wear and tear over a long-term period and we start to have less less regulation with that nervous system and in anxiety what happens is someone's stress response if it gets turned on and then turns back off and then turns on and then turns back off after a while it sort of stays half-heartedly on so say when you were 20 you were your stress coping sat at say a five five out of ten stressful things happen you know it might seem like the end of the world at the day but the next at the time but the next day you're back to normal again what happens over time, though, is that with life getting busier, getting married, having children, mortgages, coronavirus, our stress level is like someone turning up the volume on our car radio now. Until now, your new stress baseline is, say, seven or an eight. Now, the problem is when you're a seven or an eight, it doesn't take too much extra for you to feel like you're hitting that glass ceiling again. You're hitting a 10 regularly now. For predisposed individuals, what my analogy is that it's kind of like if we keep it in that glass ceiling often enough, eventually we're going to break through that ceiling. We're going to break that off switch. And now when stressful events happen, the anxiety, you're into that anxiety mode and it's like a runaway train and then it might be just starting to settle again and then something else sets it off again. So now we've got this miscommunication between our conscious nervous system and our autonomic or subconscious or our um, pre-programmed stress response. Kind of like the, the analogy I often use is, you know, when um, people are having a bit of a, a, um, a crash and burn or what we used to call a nervous breakdown, you know, often they're sort of sitting in the crying, corner crying, saying, what on earth is wrong with me? I can't stop crying. A little bit like me trying to tap away on this keyboard here and not getting any response on my screen and getting all frustrated and stressed about that. But the problem is not the keyboard or the screen. The problem is that the hard drive's crashed. So anxiety is a bit of an example of this, of where the hard drive is not communicating with the software well and the software is running the show in some respects. So part of recovering and improving our resilience with anxiety is we need to sort of reset that whole nervous system. If that, I don't know whether that's a good analogy or not. But um, basically, it's, um, it's what happens when a nervous system, a predisposed nervous system is overloaded long enough through life events, through trauma, but just through the biggest stress, I believe, is what I call unrelenting, unremitting stress, where we're just all on a high level of stress all the time now. And I think from there, it doesn't take too much extra to push us if you're predisposed into that next phase. So, you know, much as we all talk about um, you know, learning meditation and journaling and de-stressing, there is a lot of relevance to that in that we've got to kind of calm the nervous system down so that the nervous system can, can repair.
<clears throat> now, with, um, with anxiety, with this stress response, we have to remember that it's not just our adrenals. You know, in the past, we talk about adrenal stress and stress burnout in people that were under a lot of stress for a long period of time and that that could contribute to anxiety. But um, now we know that our stress response is really determined by our hypothalamus, our pituitary, our thyroid's involved, our adrenals are involved, and our um, gonads are involved, so ovaries in women, testes in men. So now we find that under stress, it's all of these systems that get out of regulation, and that's why often with anxiety, it's not just anxiety that will be the problem, we'll have issues with our circadian rhythm. So we'll have trouble getting to sleep or trouble staying asleep. We'll have trouble with our body temperature. We might be feeling more hot flushes or we might be feeling the cold more if your thyroid's also involved. Our energy levels will be all over the place, but mostly low or definitely on the lower side. Um, we can be hungrier, we can be less thirsty. Um, our weight slip point can shift so we can put on 10 kilos over a 12 month period you know, where we feel like we're not eating any differently. Um, sleep, we've talked about mood and also sex drive can be affected as well. So often anxiety doesn't just exist as anxiety is an issue and your whole health spines. You know, dysregulation of your whole hormonal balance because of prolonged stress over a long-term period, that seems to set up this pattern. But there is good news. I promise you there is good news coming because as you can imagine so far, we're seeing that you know anxiety really is a result of a predisposed individual being under a lot of stress or pressure for a long time to the point where their whole nervous system and stress coping response has shifted, causing a whole change through all the hormonal systems in the body. What are my drivers? So some of the things that I feel really can contribute to this stress on the nervous system over a long-term period um, is, so yeah, there's five drivers. This first cartoon says, um, I'm still thirsty. Maybe I've got leaky gut syndrome. So you know a talk from, from a naturopath, particularly myself, wouldn't be complete unless we talked about the gut and particularly leaky gut. We'll come back to that in a minute. So emotional trauma. Now, as I was saying before, unrelenting, unremitting stress, that high level of stress that we all sort of rev up into and sort of live at, that I believe is one of the biggest causes of why our nervous system can then eventually crash and we end up with anxiety. Um, but definitely an aggravating factor can be emotional trauma as well. You know, I have friends that have anxiety that don't believe there really has been any big emotional traumas contributing to their anxiety. They're, the, they're, they're my friends that say, you know, I was born anxious. Um, and then I've got friends that feel like that they were fine until there were some emotional traumas and then their anxiety seemed to be triggered off after that. So, you know, everybody's, everybody's different. Poor gut health. You know, us naturopaths uh, continue talking about gut health, but there's definitely a connection between what's happening with your gut, your immune system and inflammation, and then your brain and nervous system. Um, they're finding links now even between our microbiome, the balance of bacteria in our large gut, whether they are more conducive to less anxiety or more anxiety. Some people have come up with a new term called psychobiotics. I don't go as far as that yet. I don't think the research is really there to be calling some probiotics psychobiotics, meaning that you know they do impact upon the mood directly. Um, but there's quite a few proposed ways that our gut microbiome and our gut function in initially or in, interestingly more um, messages go from our gut to our brain than our brain to our gut so you know a lot of my patients that have anxiety also seem to have an irritable bowel or gut related issues as well an irritable bowel can be you know very much tied up then with the worst stage of that which is when there's also a leaky gut involved as well liver stress and i think i'm going to talk more about that in a moment poor nutrient balance like lack of essential nutrients and one of my um, biggest areas um, that if you have poor sleep problems, nothing else in your body can work properly. Sleep problems can be a sign of heading down that path of anxiety and depression, or poor sleep patterns over a long-term period can definitely contribute to causing anxiety. So emotional trauma, you know, as I said, some of my friends said that they were born anxious. Um, family history we've talked about, personality traits, 
Um, there's a gene called the MTHFR gene, and some people have a variation in this gene, which is relatively easy to test for the gene, but more importantly is you test to see if that gene actually is a problem for you by checking homocysteine levels. But MTHFR gene variations, particularly if there's elevated homocysteine, has been linked to some um, increase in mental and emotional um, health issues. Um, there's pyrrole disorder. So again, it's a, a little known disorder that can affect up to 10% of the population. And these are the guys that, you know, I'll say to their mum, how long have you noticed the anxiety for? And their mums will say, oh, little Johnny was born anxious. You know, he's always been a kid that couldn't stand loud noises or bright lights. Or So, yeah, pyrrole disorder is a hereditary condition that results in a chronic deficiency of zinc and B6, which is so important for a healthy functioning um, stress response. So sometimes we'll test for these. Um, anxious sense. I'm a big fan of timeline therapy. You know, getting patients to write down their full health history um, chronologically in bullet point on an A4 sheet of paper. Sometimes just stepping back yourself and looking at the events and your health over a period of time, you can feel more at peace that you can understand how you've arrived where you are and also get more direction about what to do to recover. Um, stressful life events. Um, and I'm a big fan of psychologists and counsellors and people that specialise in anxiety um, poor gut health so we've talked a bit about this interactions between the gut and brain can occur in various ways <coughs> um, as i said we're saying the microbes there's still a lot more like we're loving the whole new microbiome look and you know checking out what your bacterial balance actually looks like but there's very much early stages yet of understanding what it all means but some really interesting stuff coming through um, but you can have a look at that slide yourself. But gut, immune, brain, very real um, relationship between the two. So if um, I find for a lot of my patients that have anxiety and IBS, if we can get their IBS better, mind you, stress can aggravate your IBS. So we can get their gut better, work out what foods are triggering their problems, heal the gut wall, then often we'll find that their anxiety is a lot better. So even without having to give them anything to treat their anxiety, by treating the gut, we'll often see a big improvement with anxiety. So as I said, we were saying earlier, it's really a whole health, whole health condition, not just a brain chemical imbalance. A liver stress. So this is a really big one. So, you know, patients will say, what's your liver got to do with, what's my liver got to do with my anxiety? And um, like one of the concepts that we have from a naturopathic point of view, one of the reasons we can live a long time is because the body has four filters, digestion, liver, immune, kidneys, when we're 20, temper, tall and bulletproof, eat anything, drink anything. Who remembers when they're 20? Well, some of you might only be 20 anyway. Um, as we get older, that's when our four filters start to clog up. You know, digestion, we'll know we get bloating, wind, bowel variability, bread makes us feel bloated, our milk can make us feel a bit nauseous. So we become more reactive or intolerant to certain foods that are probably no good for us in the first place. Um, after the liver, after the digestion, though, it's the liver. How you know your liver's under stress is fatigue. If you wake up tired every morning, always feeling like you could roll over and go back to sleep, that to me is a sign that your liver's under stress. Headaches, dizziness, thyroid problems, cholesterol problems. Um, with the liver, I also associate mood swings, depression, anger, and anxiety. So if someone sees me suffering from anxiety, I always think, okay, what's, what are they eating? What are they coming in contact with? What hormones are they producing that are, are putting stress or adding a burden to their liver detoxability? Um, so one of the the best things you can do if you're suffering from anxiety is clean your diet up, get onto a really clean, healthy eating plan, whole foods, try and cut out alcohol, caffeine. Caffeine has a half-life of about six hours. So if you have a cup of coffee at 10 in the morning, six hours later, you've still got half that amount of caffeine floating around your bloodstream. If you've had another three or four, you can be going to bed of a night time with the equivalent of two cups of coffee worth of caffeine still in your bloodstream which you might fall asleep quickly because you're so exhausted but that caffeine and maybe your nervous system still too turned on will stop you from getting in those deep restorative cycles of sleep and if you come up to one of the lighter patches and pop awake then you can be awake for an hour and a half so alcohol is the same a lot of my clients in the early days sort of swear that you know a couple of drinks and they tend to sleep better 
But um, a lot of my clients, as they get older, say a couple of glasses of wine now, and they have a worse night's sleep. Because one of the signs that the liver's under stress is that the liver detoxes, according to our circadian rhythm, between 1 and 3 a.m. So a couple of wines now, the liver's already a little bit overburdened. You're going to pop, it's going to pop you awake when the liver's working harder between 1 and 3. So, um, yeah, as I was going to say, or we'll say in a little while, sleep quality is just so important to trying to heal and repair, restore your nervous function. Um, hormonal change as well. Again, the more challenge that someone has from a menopause point of view, often that's a sign that their liver is under stress. So two signs that your liver is under stress. Number one is caffeine does upset you now more than it used to. One cup's fine, but two cups makes you feel more jittery and jangly. Um, and alcohol, you know, one glass of wine is fine, but two glasses give you a headache. Um, or if you find um, smells and perfumes um, give you a headache, that's a sign that your liver is under stress and that you need to do a bit of a detox or a cleanse. And that will help your nervous system to function more smoothly as well. Poor nutrient balance. Magnesium, my number one nutrient um, for anything to do with the nervous system. Helps with muscle aches and pains, restless legs, twitchy legs. Often a sign of being low in magnesium is if you lower eyelid flickers, uh, which is also a sign of stress as well. So magnesium, awesome with anything to do with muscles. It's low in our soil. Uh, most of my patients are deficient. How you know that you need magnesium, rather, if you take it and you feel a lot better for it, then you should be taking it all the time, or at least until your body's back in balance. Magnesium helps to increase GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter in the brain. It puts the brakes on the brain's activity, um, particularly good for sleep issues and also um, things like, or conditions like ADD. Zinc, so zinc, another common deficiency that we see, that I see a lot. Um, zinc also in good levels helps to raise GABA and zinc and copper ratios need to be kept at a ratio of one to one for optimum mental health as well. So with pyrrole, as I was saying before, often associated with a chronic zinc deficiency, but one of the ways we check or adjust dosages is we check the zinc, zinc to copper ratio. Um, B6, all of the B vitamins definitely when it comes to stress and nervous system are important, um, but B6 particularly um, important for the production of neurotransmitters, serotonin, which is linked to depression, GABA for calming the brain. Um, and acetylcysteine, another nutrient that I love to do, love to use whenever we're talking about brain. Um, one of the thoughts or one of the new thoughts out about both anxiety and depression is that we're possibly seeing an increased uh, production of inflammatory what are called cytokines or chemicals within the brain's own natural immune response. So the brain sort of sits a bit off center with the rest of the body, but some people or a lot of people can actually get an inflammatory response gets triggered in their brain that then helps to, or leads to shifting brain chemicals as well. n acetylcysteine is the major precursor or a precursor to glutathione, which is one of the major antioxidants that helps protect the brain. And it's also anti-inflammatory to the brain as well. B12, important particularly if there's methylation issues, removal of heavy metals and healthy nervous system and brain function. And sleep, as I was saying before, sleep's probably my biggest thing. If you want to get a better handle on your anxiety, get your sleep sorted. Find out what's going on for you. So many of my patients will say, you know, I've had such a big day today. I'm so going to sleep well tonight. But they're often their worst night's sleep because they're been overstimulated, there's too much cortisol, there's too much stress hormone. It's kind of like they've had 15 cups of coffee a day and then go to go to sleep, but they've got all this stress hormone floating around and maybe their liver's not clearing it as effectively as it should. So now they try to go to sleep and their nervous system is just buzzing. Um, helps to reset the body clock. There's some great research going around about circadian rhythms and how to reset <clears throat> pardon me, your circadian rhythm. So check out some great work by a researcher called Sachin Panda. Um, uh, cortisol and sleep patterns. You know, if we overstimulate that cortisol is our long-term stress hormone. If you have a pattern of winding down of a night time, but if you get second wind and come back, your nervous system turns back on and you're staying up too late, you've got a dysregulation there with your cortisol. Um, a really neat test that we do with some patients is a salivary cortisol profile, but not just the profile. We test, get a salivary sample of, it's called the cortisol awakening profile, actually. 
So we test your cortisol by checking you spitting into a, a tube. So we test your salivary cortisol. We do one when, when, you, when you wake, one 30 minutes later, one 30 minutes later, and then we do three more during the day. Determining or depending on the pattern, we can see from that response whether your nervous system is overshooting, whether you're producing too much cortisol, whether you're revving up at the night time where you should be turning down because you want your cortisol levels to be right down at the night time, about 9, 9.30 is the ideal time to be asleep by because the cortisol needs to be right down for your brain to then produce melatonin. And melatonin is the chemical that puts us in those lovely deep sleep cycles where we restore, where the cerebral spinal fluid flushes over the brain and washes out toxins that cause aging and Alzheimer's and dementia. So sleep is by far and away for me, my number one area to really try and get sorted teenagers and sleep patterns what a shocker you know i know my kids particularly um, matt when he was younger real big issues with you know getting revved up of a night time um, and staying up way too late and seriously the ideal time to be asleep by is 9 30 and how you know you've had a good night's sleep is when you wake up in the morning before your alarm goes off you wake up and it's almost a surprise to you that it's morning if you wake up every day and you can describe what your quality of sleep has been like, you're not sleeping well. So get some help. Video games, social media, getting onto screens. You know, we, we give our kids all this advice, but who here as an adult, you know, will be lying in bed of a night time and checking out Facebook one more time or so. Um, and yeah, so, and so many of my little kids too are starting off life already with sleep issues. And this is where melatonin can be a great help. So, there's a lot of really great natural medicines that can really help to reestablish sleep patterns. But if you get nothing else out of this presentation that, of where you want to start to work, work on the sleep. As I said, sleep can be a, a, um, a causative factor or it can be a sign of anxiety and depression as well. So, so this is just a, um, a bit of a mind map that I did up, just showing you some of the ways that things can add to it add together to end up down that road of anxiety. So this is seven-year-old Emily, highly anxious in social situations and new environments. Um, fussy eater, so there's going to be, you know there's going to be nutritional deficiency. Who doesn't know kids that are um, fussy eaters these days? History of bedwetting, which can indicate low B12 and magnesium. History of allergies to food and pollen, so we know there's inflammation. Nightmares three times a week, stress, anxiety, and poor sleep patterns, frequent ear infections, and a history of antibiotics. So already in that sort of profile, and it's not an uncommon profile for what I've seen, what I would see, we can see that there's um, up here, there's sleep disturbance, um, there's dysbiosis or gut imbalance from history of antibiotic use. So we've got poor sleep, uh, imbalance of good and bad bacteria, We've got the nutritional deficiencies from being a picky eater. Um, we've got reduced cofactors there to produce the neurotransmitters in the brain. And with that um, uh, allergies, we're getting the release of inflammatory meters, mediators, more inflammation that may also affect the brain as well. So coupled with the family history, you can see that these things are going to be adding together. Nine-year-old male Sam, and so teenagers and the young young men particularly, but women also that I really worry about um, this age group are just so susceptible to, you know, so many things these days, you know, drugs, alcohol, um, just the social pressure as well. So Sam, history of lethargy, fatigue, anxiety and depression, doesn't eat breakfast, um, trying to, you know, be a bit buff. So has his tin tuna with potentially high levels of mercury, boiled eggs, protein shake, popcorn, chips, and sweet potato. So nothing green at all. Poor sleep habits, stays up late playing video games, sleeps in late casual cannabis user. So a little bit of an accident waiting to happen, young Sam. But again, it's our culture and our society that's given the kids this, these patterns, I'm sure. So with Sam, we're looking at definitely blood sugar, down to the left of the slide, blood sugar, skipping meals which, you know, some kids, if they don't eat, are more emotionally reactive and that's going to contribute to anxiety. Down to the right-hand side, we've got sleep disturbance and poor sleep ha habits. 
leading to an overactive hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access, increased inflammation, et cetera, down to anxiety. We've got the recreational drug use, which leads to increased oxidative stress, particularly in the brain, and can then lead on to um, um, anxiety and poor stress response. To the left, we've got nutritional deficiencies because he is a picky eater. Um, and then we've definitely got you know, low levels of things like zinc and low selenium. So we're getting increased oxidative stress. We've got possible mercury exposure from eating tuna every day. So you can sort of see that a lot of the resilience that Sam might be getting from his diet, from his lifestyle to help cope just with normal stress, like his diet and lifestyle is contributing to a lot of his um, health related issues before we even look at what else is going on in his world outside of what that pattern that is in. And 29 year old Sarah. So 29 year old Sarah is probably what I see as 22 year old Sarah. Um, a lot of young kids that, you know, like young girls I'm seeing coming in the office with that have maybe been on the pill for quite a few years is a bit of a concern for me that have been diagnosed as having anxiety, depression, and very often have gut issues as well. Um, and always perfectionist and high achiever. Back to Sarah, high stress job, partner in a law firm, it's a vegetarian diet, so potentially low, going to be low in B12, zinc and iron. Um, taking the pill for 10 years, this means that the patient's not ovulated through this time, so we've got excess estrogen, and a history of gut infections when traveling overseas and digestion has never been the same. So again, if we look at the different areas, like even being on the pill for a long period of time can lead to elevated copper levels, and again, copper and zinc, the ratio between the two are important when we look at both oxidative stress, but also emotional responses. When someone's taking the pill for a long period of time, pharmacists should always hand out a good quality of women's multi and a probiotic as well, because the pill long-term will reduce levels of things like folate, B2, B6, C, E, magnesium, selenium, and zinc, um, as well as can, the, being on the pill continuous can upset the balance of good and bad bacteria in the gut. Um, again, increase oxidative stress, reduce brain chemical production and anxiety. Um, the oral contraceptive pill can also block progesterone production, um, leading to inadequate allopregnenolone production, uh, reduced glutamate inhibition, less GABA stimulation. So being on the pill can directly increase someone's potential towards being more anxious as well. Uh, dysbiosis from history of gut issues, again, vagal nerve activation, high stress job, that unrelenting, unremitting stress, um, and being vegetarian, that maybe is not looking after the nutrients that could be lacking. So I hope that's given you those three people. Fortunately, those people um, aren't real as such. They're not based on patients. However, I would say that I see these three people all the time. So, yeah, only the names change. Common thing. So, when we talk about anxiety, obviously, you know, in our world of, of natural medicine and in the, the outside world as well, it's hard not to get away from, you know, I'm feeling anxious, what pill can I take? I hope that, you know, what we've discussed here is that getting your anxiety under control or living, living with your anxiety first or you know, recognizing you've got anxiety, but you, you know, putting it in the back of the bus and you driving the bus now and rather than your anxiety driving the bus um, is all totally capable or possible. But it's, it's from my point of view, it's taken that holistic view is what's going to give you the best, best result long term. So saying that there's two types of treatment we talk about when I talk about when dealing with my patients with anxiety, there's the acute you know, obviously, we want to try and turn down that stress response to a more normal response as quickly as possible um, because it's hard to feel better and hard to do the things you need to do to help yourself unless you actually start to feel better for, in the first place. And then give yourself the time to address the underlying drivers. Um, so natural remedies for anxiety, definitely I'm a big fan of psychologists and counsellors, particularly ones that specialise in anxiety. There's some great cognitive therapy and tips and tools that you can start to use um, that really will make a massive difference. However, they all work best when you're actually feeling a little bit better in, your, in yourself. Like the hardest time to help yourself with cognitive 
therapy is when you're actually in the middle of a full-blown you know panic attack it's a bit like the horse has already bolted so sometimes you've got to feel better to be able to then help yourself more whole foods diet can't emphasize enough you know getting your diet as clean as possible um, exercise exercise in increases the production of positive endorphins like you'll feel like a lot of people suffering with anxiety exercise is a great way of burning that extra nervous energy up sleep you know as i said before get your sleep pattern sorted you need to be gently going to sleep by yourself at 9 30 and waking up you know in the morning about 6 6 30 and surprise as if you, you can't believe you've been asleep the whole night that's how you know you've had a good night's sleep as i said but there's lots of great natural remedies and there's lots of great tips on the internet um there's lots of great apps you can download about you know learning meditation and um learning ways to still your mind but my tip with having better quality sleep is you've got to be calmer and less stressed during the day because you kind of got to manage your nervous system during the day so it can do its natural thing at the night time. Learn meditation and mindfulness. Um, my favorite term probably is more awareness. We need to be more aware of how we function, how we cope with stress. The more you can understand yourself, the better place you are to actually help yourself more. Reduce your body stresses. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and there's some awesome natural medicines that we use that can really help in both acute and restorative um, practices. Whole foods diet, I'm not gonna to talk too much about this today, but there's so much information on the internet. You know, a Mediterranean style of diet or a paleo diet, they're both great ways of detoxing and reducing a lot of inflammatory sorts of foods. Getting a test for food intolerance is a good one. If you've got a lot of gut related issues that seem to be tied up with your anxiety, and I guarantee there will be a connection there, then um, getting tested for food intolerance sometimes fast tracks in that you can work out what foods you definitely shouldn't be having and then build your diet back up from there. Uh, exercise, as I said, absolutely essential. Healthy sleep patterns we've talked about. Um, and actually, interestingly, interestingly, at the moment with the coronavirus, everyone's really focused on trying to be as healthy as possible. Sleep quality, sleep practice, good quality sleep. They did a great study where someone had a normal, ideal a level of sleep, went to bed at 9.30, slept right through, and then they tested their level of what are called natural or circulating natural killer cells. So they had a baseline of what a healthy level is for, was for this person. That next night, they, they, gave them only, they, they gave them a disturbed sleep pattern. They only slept for six hours. The next day, their level of circulating natural killer cells, which is the bodies like um, guard dogs or watchdogs, was down to half what it was the day before. So sleep deprivation, deprivation is probably one of the biggest aggravators for why your immune system is not going to be so effective. So, yeah, definitely get your sleep. Um, and signs that you're not getting good quality sleep, frequent yawning during the day, um, nodding off when you're reading or in a meeting. Um, sleep apnea is definitely is the silent killer if you are nodding off or if you're having, feeling like you might need to have micro sleeps in your car, get tested for sleep apnea as well. Um, there's lots of help these days. The new machines are so much better than the old machines. So yeah, so get, do a sleep study if you have to, but get your sleep sorted. Uh, and there's a guy called Matthew Walker who's written a good book on why we sleep if you wanna do a bit of a night. Um, bedtime reading and that's the other thing that can really help too is go to bed and read for an hour before you go to sleep don't go to bed and watch screens or tvs uh learn to meditate and you know so many of my patients and you can imagine which patients they are they're the ones that are too wrapped and too highly strung will say i can't meditate i tried it once and i just couldn't do it i always say look it's a bit like driving the car you've got to you do have to keep practicing until you get really good at it once you become good at it you can meditate anywhere um and it's not as hard as it sounds and there's lots of free apps there smiling mind headspace abc life matters there's so many resources around these days um patrick king does a, a great facebook live meditation on a sunday night uh, monday night at 7 30. Uh, if you've not heard of patrick king she does some fantastic work down at barrel for people suffering from grief and trauma 
So check out her stuff because she's got some beautiful meditation um, DVDs and things like that as well and does some great courses in um, helping people recover with PTSD and et cetera. So there's so much support around these days. Reduce body stresses. So get your health sorted. Fix your leaky gut. Try and dietary-wise reduce toxins. Do a bit of a liver detox or a liver cleanse. Work out what foods you're intolerant to. Um, make sure that you're um, treating any underlying chronic infections um, because you want to you want to make sure your immune system's working really well. So many of my patients that, that I see that have chronic fatigue, you know, the four pathways to chronic fatigue for me are adrenal stress or that stress burnout, um, chronic gut issues, irritable bowel, dysbiosis, leaky gut, um, chronic infections, you know, people that have had glandular fever, you know, a lot of my patients with anxiety have also had glandular fever. So I think there's a bit of a connection between um, what we call a bit of a viral load or infection load that someone's carrying. So we're going to try and sort that out as well. And then the fourth aggravator seems to be toxins. You know, in the past we talked about heavy metals. Now we're talking about mold and mold toxins with all the floods and the water damage, etc. Mold is a bigger problem these days than people realize. So I've had patients with anxiety that when we sorted their mold problem out, their anxiety cleared. So try and find out what is causing your body to be stressed and go about um, remedying that. There's always a discussion with anxiety about, well, do I take something from a doctor or do I try something natural? Um, what I would say is that um, it's whatever seems to be best for you at that time. You know, I'm not against people taking medications for severe anxiety if it's really necessary. Uh, but however, what we can do is even if you're taking medication, we can work underneath to improve these other areas of your health so that when you do eventually get to the point where you want to come off that medication through your GP or your psychiatrist, um, then your body's going to be a lot more supported. I see a lot of patients coming in for anxiety that are taking medication. I see a lot of patients coming in for help with anxiety that aren't taking medication and want to try and avoid taking medication. So with those patients, I always say, well, let's give this six weeks. If you're not feeling tremendously better in six weeks, then we may have to consider some medication through your GP or through your psychiatrist for a short period of time because anxiety is not something that you want to be running your life for too long a period of time because it's such a debilitating condition. So I'm all about doing what's best for, for you, the patient, and everybody's different. When it comes to taking natural medicines, please don't just go to the health food store or the supermarket and buy stuff off the shelf yourself. Quality in Australia, we've got very strict regulation with TGA, but that TGA doesn't look at the efficacy, the, um, the amount of natural medicine, the amount of the therapeutic ingredient, what studies or tests or trials were done, how much of that medication or that actual ingredient was needed to bring about those results. Practitioner only product is based on research and science. So, um, and I really believe that we only here in Mullen Health use the best quality natural medicines available in Australia and if not the world. Like I wouldn't even get online and buy stuff from America because they just don't have the strict regulation that we have. So, you know, whenever you're taking any natural medicine, you know, always talk to your naturopath about it. Because remember, they're supplements, they're natural medicine, but they can, they, they're still a form of medicine so yeah get good advice natural remedies one of my favorite um, tablets for anxiety is a product called neurocalm i call this my herbal valium tongue-in-cheek but um, a lot of my patients say that it really seems to help reset that stress coping um, response um, it tends to promote GABA and reduce glutamate Carver. Uh, now, in Australia, um, there was a world first clinical study by an Australian team at Monash University, and they found that kava was just as effective with no side effects compared to the benzodiazepine family. So, non addictive, non hypnotic. Um, now, kava is an interesting one. Some of my patients love it, some of my patients will get funny dreams with it. So, Again, different horses for courses, but we might try Neurocalm, we might add in some Carver. So again, it depends on the person. Nutrition, you know, uh, anyone I see for anxiety, I'm always putting them onto a really good quality magnesium glycinate product because I know that the magnesium is going to be well absorbed, it's going to get where it needs to be. 
and the magnesium powders we have have all the other cofactors um, necessary to do what they're supposed to do. So I'd always recommend for someone with anxiety, a good quality magnesium powder, a good quality supplement that supports um, that hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis with lots of um, B5 particularly and B6. Um, we've talked a bit about that. So GABA is the inhibitor neurotransmitter that, that helps to calm, regulate nerve cells and calms anxiety. Um, any anxiety drugs like Xanax and Valium actually work to increase the amount of GABA in the brain. So it's interesting that the target's kind of the same. Uh, GABA can also be prescribed as an amino acid. Um, also herbs like valerian root or passion flower can also increase naturally increase your brain's GABA levels. So interesting that we're all trying to bring about the same response in the brain, which is an increase in that GABA. Herbal medicines. There's, herbal medicines are kind of our secret weapon on top of our nutritional formulas from a naturopathic point of view. Our herbs um, work more like drugs in some respects. It's not the right terminology, but the, the, the active ingredients in our herbs bring about biochemical change. Um, and they come from a history of um, safety and efficacy over thousands of years. And science now is starting to catch up and prove that, you know, what we've been saying for a long time with herbs such as, say, kava is actually true. Um, so, yeah, so herbal medicine is, is I love herbs. Um, I love the fact that I can make up a mix for a patient. We can put something in there for their liver, something for adrenal support, something that's calming. We can put something in there that's going to help with balancing hormone levels, and we can put something in there that's going to help with their skin or their gut. So herbal medicines can be there, the, the ideal form of what we call bespoke medicines. It can really be tailored to the individual. Um, now everyone says, what about the taste? Don't worry, we've got some great tips on how to get around that. Ashwagandha or uh, withania, probably one of my favorite herbs to balance the adrenals or balance the nervous system, also good for the thyroid. Um, and this is an example of herbs we might use in, a, in an anxiety mix. Um, passion flower is an amazing herb. You can actually take a shot of passion flower and it will almost instantly calm you down. So some really great tools. My personal lifestyle tips, early morning sunlight, anxiety, getting your circadian rhythm back on track, getting to bed earlier, getting up earlier, getting some of that natural sun stimulation first thing in the morning really helps to reset the brain. Uh, earthing, you know, going for a walk barefoot in the morning, um, time spent in nature. And at the moment, um, because exercise is probably one of the only things we are allowed to do outside, Try and make sure we make the most of this time. If you're saving time on commuting by walking, working from home, get out and go for a walk first thing. Um, learning breathing exercises. If you take our method of breathing, it's awesome. Anxiety, interestingly, changes our breathing patterns. If you can learn breathing exercises, you'll actually change your anxiety. So don't overestimate or underestimate the benefits of um, breathing, breathing exercises if you're experiencing anxiety. Um, and meditation, do a course, you know, while we've all got part of me more time. And some great resources there as well. So I hope you've um, got some good tips from what we've been talking about. You know, there's a familiar predisposition there, but it doesn't mean that we have to be taken over by our anxiety and our anxiety, you know, run the show and not us be in charge of what our nervous system is doing. Um, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation in different format to, you know, me talking live in front of an audience of 100, 120 people at, at our hall at Charlestown that we use. However, um, you know, I hope you've got some great tips. And if you have liked what I've talked about today, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to give us a call. As I said, we do have that free 15 minute call with one of our practitioners and or you can call actually call directly through the herb bar and speak to one of our qualified naturopaths there as well if you'd like to try any things any of the things i've talked about today if they were going to be relevant for you now please we have lots of resources um this slide says it will email you tonight but um i should have taken that off we won't be we well, possibly will be emailing you something so let's see um how we go with that uh, also, if you've really liked this presentation, I would love some feedback 
about this format, whether you found it was still useful, whether you feel it went for too long, too short, didn't give you enough practical tips, I would really love your feedback. If you really love what we do as well, if you can give us a five-star review, that's even better. But more importantly for me is some really good feedback about what you actually thought of this, this presentation and this format. Remember the herb bar. You know, if you need help with acute situations or you just want to have a chat about what's going on, if you're feeling extra stressed at the moment, give our girls or our practitioners at the herb bar a call. Um, it's a complimentary chat and they can prescribe something for you. However, if you need to dive a bit deeper or dig a bit deeper, then please talk to them about um, making an appointment with one of our awesome naturopaths. And that's pretty much me done. So um, thank you all again. Um, I've really enjoyed presenting. Um, it is a little bit difficult not getting that feedback from an audience. However, um, as I said, if you've really enjoyed um, this presentation, please let me know. And if we can be of any help to you at all or your family in the meantime, please give us a call. Take care, everyone.